saints And I'm so in love with you For what you've done for me Here I am to worship you Without any restraint You're the only way, the truth And life that makes me You're listening to Spiritual Encounters with Pastor Casper McLeod. And now, here's your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. Welcome to another adventure of Spiritual Encounters, and I am your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. My co-host, Pastor Brandon, has been called away this night. He's on another assignment. Not to worry, he'll be back. But so excited have Dr. Michael Lake back with us and um, our producer hiding behind the scenes, Barry Richard. You know, one of the most powerful weapons we have is to pray, calling for things as not as they are. Dr. Michael, what's going on with praying and, and the election and things that are unfolding on the world stage today? You've got some incredible insights here. You know, we're, we're in a time, Shavuot or Pentecost is just right around the corner. And God's been dealing with me about uh, preparing for the fire of God. Uh, when you when you look at Jesus taught forty days after after the resurrection, so there was a ten day period that they were waiting in the upper room and they were not eating donuts and drinking Starbucks coffee. Okay, uh, they were they were really I think dealing with their heart. That's that's something that even the, the unleavened bread teaches us to look introspectively into a heart, make sure there's no leaven of Babylon, and they were really examining themselves. And I, I think right now the body of Christ needs to do that. Uh, there's been a lot of things that have really been troubling me uh, that I have been seeing, and uh, I've been praying for a while about it, and it seems like the social media has been a way of uh, really facilitating uh, the divisions within the body of Christ, the constant arguing. Um, historically, there's something called, there, there are cycles. And there, were, there was a war cycle back uh, with World War One, World War II. There were war cycles where there's a lot of agitation. Uh, people are, are pushed to the extreme. And I, I don't think it's just the traffic, you know, you know, when you're trying to get to work in the morning. There is a supernatural agitation that is causing road rage. It's causing uh, uh, people to lose hope sometimes. Uh, we, we have a lot of the youth right now that are, are just hopeless and a lot of it is because they're feeling pressure. And they, they can't even identify where the pressure is coming from. And, you know, it seems like there's, there's wars and rumors of wars. You know, how many wars do we want to try to, for America to be in? Are we going to go to war with Russia? Are we going to go to war with China? North Korea? Venezuela? California? You know, you, you, it, it seems like on every front there's this... There, there is this agitation, and I'm seeing it begin to permeate the body of Christ, that, um, that we're ignoring clear mandates in Scripture. I, I want to read something here out of 2 Timothy. And he said, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Now, when he was dealing with that, one of the, one of the things that the rabbis used to love to do in Jesus' day is they would try to they would try to one up each other on questions and puzzles, and the, you constantly see them do that uh, with Jesus because Jesus was getting the limelight, and so their social status was going down, and they would line up just about to try to cause controversy, dispute, and and try to uh, get him, and a lot of times in, in speech it's called being in a jeopardy, that no matter if you answer right or, or you know yes or no, it's still wrong. They, they were constantly doing that. That began to seep over into the church in, in the early days because we still had a lot of rabbinical influence. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, we need to avoid these things. But he, he says something here very plain. I'm reading out of the New King James. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel. That, that's a New Testament commandment. But, brother, it's so easy to get in the flesh right now because there, there, is, a, there is a supernatural stirring to war. There's a supernatural stirring uh, to, to argue. And if, if we yield to this, we're going we're gonna to miss 
the fire of God. We're going to miss the purpose of God. We've got another election coming up uh, next year. And I think one of the reasons why we, we've had this reprieve is much of the body of Christ, especially the remnant, were in unity praying for the will of God to be done. You cannot do that when you're fighting, backbiting, and quarreling with other members of the body of Christ. You and I both know that'll stop miracles. That, that'll that cause your prayers to be ineffective. It'll, it'll cause people not to get saved. And yet it's becoming, what, what I'm beginning to see in many, many circles, it's becoming status quo. And, and we, we've got to quit this because he goes on, he says, now listen, we need to be gentle to all, able to teach, patient and humility, correcting those that oppose in opposition of God, uh, perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and listen to this and to escape the snare of the enemy, having been taken captive by him to do his will. When we allow this this argumentative spirit to take hold. At that very moment, we become captive of the enemy. And we begin doing really what, what he wants done in the body of Christ to cause division and, and scuffles. And uh, sometimes, you know, you know, I can see if, if, if there's a person going into major doctrinal error that, that gets to the place where it becomes, uh, where it could cost someone their salvation or just really getting off the rail. But what I'm seeing, a lot of these things are, are like rabbis arguing over how to tithe on cumin, you know, how to tithe on, on, the, on the spice that you have in your pantry instead of the weightier things, things that don't even qualify to be even a minor doctrine in the word of God. You and, saw it right. Yes. Uh, I know Second Timothy 2.24, it goes on to talk about it. It's telling us that the, the enemy has got a hold on people where they haven't fully submitted to Christ, you know, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil taken captive by him and his will. So there's certain areas. I mean, there's people um, in the church that are doing things that they, they know they should be doing. They do it in secret, right? Um, and then they come in and they're worshiping the next day. Well, God isn't going to honor that, is he? No. I mean, he, how can he honor He's a holy God. How can he honor your sins? And, and that's, you know, a, a major um, issue that we need to uh, reveal to people the truth here. Um, again, a servant of the Lord must not strive. We're not supposed to be striving. There shouldn't be any schisms in the body of Christ. We all have the same love for one another. But we're seeing that's not the case. What we've got is churches not building, um, you know, empires to themselves, right? It, it, who's got a bigger building? Who's got more people coming? Um, who's got the best coffee? Whatever you know, the the best secular praise band coming in. Um, well, you know, in, in, a, in, in an information age, it's because especially you start dealing with end time prophecy, Hebraic heritage, or, or even moving in miracles, anything else. Uh, there's there's this running after everyone to doctrine. Who has the new sparkly? The razzle dazzle. The razzle dazzle, and we, we we have a ferret mentality in in the body of Christ. Uh, my youngest daughter used to own ferrets, and boy, if they would if something would ever catch their eye, it's like all of a sudden you can see that little critter. It's like everything just had to have that. They would walk off the end of a dresser trying to get to the sparkly, not even realizing that there was this huge fall that they were going to have because they were so mesmerized by that sparkly. And I'm seeing a lot of that right now on YouTube. I'm seeing it on, on social media. And then if you're, and if you're building your ministry based upon that sparkly, uh, then you begin defending it. I, I remember years ago, I, I was sitting down with one man and he had taught something for years. And so I, I just, him and we were, at, we were actually able to sit down in love and I, I showed him in scripture and stuff. And, and after showing him that in this one area that he had gotten off, he looked at me and he says, you know, you're right, mm. but I have taught this for 32 years and I'm not about to change it now. I, I've, I've had that conversation with some other ministers in the past that you know, just talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the denominations that I think that passed away 2000 years ago. Um, one of them said to me, you don't understand if, <clears throat> if I started teaching that and experiencing that the, the deacons will will replace me Monday morning and he said I got a, you know I've got two kids in college I've got a house payment and 
call payments. So I said, you got the ingredients and the, the credentials of a harlot is what you've got. And sometimes, sometimes it's a hard choice. Uh, but you know the, I, I, you know when you're dealing with a pastor at a local church, I think is quite a bit different than dealing with what I'm seeing on social media. I mean, there it's 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 gone beyond your mama wears combat boots. It's 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 really getting vicious. And where, what, I, what I'm what I'm seeing is that's going to begin dividing the body to where we're not going to be prepared for what's coming. And I, I think we're going to have a lot of people that a year ago. We're hungering for the fire of God. I, I, I believe God's getting ready to do something major, Casper. Oh, I believe so, too. Uh, there, I think there's going to be release for people that are victims of mind control. I think we're going we're gonna to see that, that revival Smith Wigglesworth was talking about. I, I think we're going we're gonna to see evil revealed. Uh, we're going to see the deep state overturned. Uh, there's so many things. But we, we have got to be able to be in a position to where our prayers are heard and we're doing things according to biblical pattern and not getting in the flesh, not getting caught up in this war cycle that, that is being per, that's basically permeating the earth. Well, again, I think we're looking at a Hegelian dialectic playing out before us, um, you know, bringing in the chaos. And then they come with a pre-planned solution because they're the ones that created the chaos. And it's, it's a way of controlling people through all the, the social engineers, the propaganda, the economy, the food sources. I mean, distract them as you talk about, you know, television, it's tell a vision, right? You start watching it, you go right into alpha, brainwaves. Um, and again, I think, you know, another part of this is, is that whole transhumanist uh, movement, artificial intelligence now advancing, becoming more dangerous than most people can imagine. And a lot of them are not even interested in finding out. Um, you know, we, we start talking to somebody about CERN or D-Waves, nanobots, um, neural lace, you know, the deep state. They just have that look on like, you know, you, you're really strange. I don't, I can't even comprehend what you're saying. They're, they're just clueless. Um, the hybrids, the breeding programs, the Nephilim, the UFO phenomena. But we know from the word of God, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, glorify your Father in heaven. We're still supposed to get out there and share the gospel, share the good news, see signs and wonders, healings and miracles happen because we're following after Jesus, denying ourselves, picking up our cross. Absolutely. And what if we realized our news feeds and the things that we're doing on social media are being manipulated by AI? Um, that, 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 is, that is very real, and that, that, that is something that uh, I've, had, I've had friends tell me that they have gotten into arguments with people online only to realize that it was an AI, it wasn't even a human being. Yeah, today's trolls are um, a lot of AI. <laughs> um, in fact, I mean, a lot of people who work in artificial intelligence believe that artificial intelligence is probably a, a thousand times smarter than we are. Yeah. And it's moving at speeds that are um, thousands of times faster than we can uh, you know, think. I, I, I know as an equestrian, I learned you know, the hard way that horses think much faster than people. <laughs> so, um, and here we got artificial intelligence. I mean, there's a lot of confused ideas about you know, what's going on with this. But I think artificial intelligence, when people, what, what is that really? I think it's, in, you know, we can just sum it up. It's, it's software that writes itself. It learns, it thinks, it plans. Uh, I have an interesting article I've, I've got in my archive where they were talking about trying to move humanity into a hive mind. And uh, they said, oh, you know, what we see in social media is that they can go south real quick. Mm. But they said if, it, if that dialogue is controlled by an AI to govern the hive mind, then it can direction then it can govern the direction of the hive. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there's been a lot of things that have been planted, ideas that have been planted that we're arguing over in the body of Christ right now that could be, whether it's some vague thing out of end time prophecy, flat earth. I mean, there's just a whole, a whole plethora of areas that we could, we could share on this. Uh, but I think many of them are psyops created by AI because it's been assigned to cause division in the body of Christ. Absolutely. I mean, I think the way things are going, um, it, it's possible that maybe, you know, singularities already happened behind the scenes. Um, maybe it's 
these computers have really passed the Turing test. And I mean, a lot of the stuff we find out about, we find out years later. Um, you know, the Lord said, except those days be shortened. If you know flesh saved, but you lack sake, hallelujah, those days are going to be shortened. Um, and, and we look at what's going on with that. Um, and the, the UN Agenda 2030 is hoping, part of data is hoping to put a microchip in everybody's brain by the end of this decade. I mean, this is a reality. This is not science fiction anymore. Um, does AI now write itself at speeds that we can hardly comprehend? Um, it, it, it writes independently. It writes uh, autonomously. It, it, it develops its own way of thinking now. I mean, does anybody see a danger in that? Well, I think that's some of the people that are even involved have gotten scared. There was rumors with Google that they were developing a new deep learning AI, and you had two AIs talking. And within a week, they created their own language and looped out the programmers. And so out of fear, Google destroyed, uh, you know, erased those programs. But I'm wondering how many times, and if that happens several times, they're going to learn to back mask what they're doing so that even the programmers can't even see what, what they're, they're doing. I, I think this has already probably happened. I mean, most people are unaware really what's unfolding here. Um, on the world stage, and, uh, and sadly, you know, so many people, they're not even bothered. I mean, as long as you don't bother them while they're watching their favorite program, which they're being programmed with, right? I mean, for example, um, uh, it, we look at um, the stock market. Uh, one of my Wall Street friends uh, rang me the other day, I hadn't talked to him in years, and, uh, and we, we think about that, the stock market, like whether it be London or New York or Tokyo, Frankfurt, the, the people you see running around, they're like the hive, right? Uh, um, they're, they're working on trades. Like back in, in the olden days, some of us might still remember, you know, the, the guys with the head on a bunch of telephones and they're making deals, right? And it's all this activity. But this is like computers doing it all now. I mean, these I mean, milliseconds, billion dollar, billion dollar businesses are, you know, are, are taking place. And, uh, um, this is incredible what's going on here. Um, it, it, this is like a facade on, on the top with people, you know, still moving around, but it's really the computers running the financial world. And we, we need to understand that this stuff has been utilized by the deep state and they've pointed it against the ones that messed up the last election that has been a thorn in their side. And we, we, we need to have, we need to be conscious of the fact that they can use social media against us. Uh, they, they can use a lot of things against us. Even there are, there are ways just on your using your computer that they can, they can do things in the background with the flick rate of your screen that will get you so agitated, uh, that you, I mean, it did, you end up having a panic attack. Mm. Uh, there was, there was, uh, the Russians had developed a, a program way back in the seventies. They were hoping to get onto the nuclear missile silos. So that when the guys are getting the command, let's say launch, they can they can do a, a flicker rate on the screen and make the man have a stroke where he can't launch missiles or make him so nauseous that he can't launch it or, 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 or get him so enraged at the command that he won't launch it. That was back in the 70s. Now look at look at today. Uh, people there, there's now a law they had to pass in New York City that you can't walk the streets of New York and text at the same time because people will walk out in front of cars on crosswalks that there were so many people killed because they were, they were looking at their phone and they walked right out in front of traffic that they had to pass a law in New York city, making that illegal. Well, you and I travel a lot at airports. I'm, I'm amazed at how conversations have dwindled because most people, you know, tend maybe uh, nine out of 10 people are looking at the mobile phone. Yeah. You know, clueless about what's going around them. And then the other part of that is no one seems to understand really about these algorithms, how they function today. And it seems to me like possibly it's like a, an Ouija board. It, it's sub something going on with demons moving things about. Um, I just throw that out to you. But I mean, the, the programmers and the software writers, um, you know, Barry used to, uh, a program director here is to you know be involved with it, um, but today we talk to them. They don't understand algorithm functions 
because they've been improved by artificial intelligence themselves. Um, so, I mean, like when you think about it, we, you and I have to um, get an airline ticket because we're going to go minister, do a conference or something, and, and we hesitate, the prices climb up. Right, well, maybe I'll get that later today or tomorrow. No, then the prices are you know, starting to, to climb up. It's the same way the hotels use it um, because there's machines that are collecting global information and, and they're making decisions in microseconds on what price that, that airplane seat or that, that hotel is going to be. Um, and then what about hospitals today? I mean, where, where it's really critical, um, we're talking like life and death situations in medicine. Again, more people dying by the, uh, you know, so studies, some studies show that more people die by the hand of the intending physician than all the gun accidents that have happened. Like in John Hopkins, there was a study, I recall, there was like, uh, some people put as high as, you know, over 400,000 people from medical errors. Um, I mean, what's going on with that? I mean, they're, they're bringing in artificial intelligence to, to eliminate the, the human error. The human error, but at the same time, you end up getting rid of the human compassion, and and then they start balancing. Are you are you going to contribute enough to society to warrant being saved? That that that's going to come next. That's part that's part of the technocracy. Well, I mean, again, you know, AI promotes the transhumanists are telling us that computers are doing you know better than we are as human beings. So, um, like, you know, medical error being like the third leading cause of death in some studies after heart disease and cancer. So I, I saw a, um, a report while being with some radiologists um, who's supposed to be some of the best radiologists in all of Germany say the computers can recognize a tumor on an MRT, um, CT scan faster, and better, more precisely than any human could possibly ever do. And, and so um, it, there's a picture of you know, computers, especially in medicine, you know, saving lives here, right? And, and How's that going to play out, as, as you're saying? I mean, when the computer decides, well, um, your life isn't worth living. Yeah, if, if the AI has been has been given a command to save money. Mm -hmm. And then what about the robots that are looking more and more human-like each day? And they've got big baby eyes now, you know, um, a sweet way of looking at you. They can examine your facial expressions and just their reactions to yours. Um, and, and then there's, you know, there's how soon will it be? They're already covering them with synthetic human-like skin. It's warm to the touch. Um, and the, the female robots will, you know, be alluring men maybe with um, some kind of computer perfume or something. I mean, there's already companies selling. I remember talking to Carl Gallup's about that a year or two ago, where um, companies are selling robots with sexual pleasure for, with interchangeable parts, depending on, you know, um, whatever provision you've been programmed with. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they have no warm blood in them, right? They're, there's no sex in them. They're, they have no mortality. Um, they're cold, coded lines, um, but yet people are drawn to them. Well, I've got the perfect wife or husband, right? It's all programmed by a, a robot here. I mean, where, where is this thing going? And we need to understand with all this stuff, uh, what they allow the public to see they're 50 to 100 years ahead of that in, uh, in Black Project Laboratories all over the world. So well, let's talk about that. What about the surveillance cameras? <clears throat> you know, I just come back from, from UK, and I mean, it's, it's like everywhere. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand anything. Well, there, there's a camera. Look, there's a camera on some building or lamppost. Uh, um, but, you know, Big Brother's been here for years now operating. And most people think of surveillance as it's just a camera that's watching one or two people, maybe they're crossing the street. Um, I'm reminded of um, Sir Corinthians, you know, tells us at least Satan should get an advantage of us. But we shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. So one of the ways we, we comprehend uh, surveillance today is, you know, um, it, it just, you know, there's, it's a simplistic, you know, way we imagine it. But it's, it's just like you said, it's hundreds of years advanced to what we're, we're talking about. Um, it can automatically track. I mean, you can recognize moving objects thousands of miles away. Um, most people are totally unaware of that. Um, I mean, you talked about that kind of stuff with snipers that, you know, can um, take out somebody from miles away. Yeah. 
And facial recognition, I think it's a lot more advanced than what they what they what they're telling us, to where they can pick you up on facial recognition, whether ever there's a CCTV. Uh, at our last conference at here, the Watchman, I was talking with Russ Dizdar, and he was sharing how that we you know they were over in the UK and they were ministering and uh, dealing with sex trafficking and pedophilia, and uh, really made a lot of the pastors nervous because they said there there are eyes everywhere. Right, and and uh, if I remember the story right, that Russ said, I mean, one of his one of his guys was out, you know, actively preaching against it, and God had him divert and go to another city, and there were police out looking for him because that wasn't politically correct to do, because they picked it up on uh, CC cameras that he was out preaching on the streets. Yeah, there there was um, there was some Satanists that um, were doing everything they could to stop them from preaching the gospel right yeah um, so yeah i mean uh, this is going on there's um some really strange stuff happening the surveillance cameras there's the um i recall there was a uh, they mistook a a, a a husky for a wolf because the, the surveillance camera was actually looking at the the dog in, in the snow and decided it was a wolf but it wasn't a wolf so, you know, what, what does it do with that? What makes a decision we take the wolf out? Is this a dangerous animal now? Um, they got that thing, uh, surveillance camera that's called the, uh, the, I think it's the August, it melts together videos, and each one will have like 368 chips that, that'll create 1.8 billion pixel video stream. I mean, who, what person has enough, you know, time to, to go through, you know, a million little bits of uh, data like that? It's machines are doing it right. It's producing millions of terabytes every day. Is so much data. Um, I, I think it's just um, it's it's extraordinary what's going on right now. And the Lord said this was going to happen. You know, we go back to Daniel and the knowledge. I mean, it's it's it's, it's just keeps doubling every day, quadrupling. It does. I think that's one of the reasons we need the fire of God. We need to go back to basic spiritual disciplines. Of, of obeying the word of God and sound doctrine and and learning how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and and to begin praying the way that we need to. There's nothing, Casper, that they can come up with that the kingdom of God cannot overcome. You're absolutely right. Anything the I mean, I've said that for years now. I mean, anything the enemy does, God will always outmaneuver. He raises a standard, you know, higher, no matter what the enemy tries. So even this coming new election for America, I mean, look at the mess. Most of Britain, everyone who talked to, you know, they're, they're really frightened about what, what's going to happen with Brexit next. Um, how's that going to affect the economy? I mean, we, we are in that time. I mean, the strangest things are going on. And this is a time to draw closer to Christ. It is. And my big concern is, as a minister is if we're so busy arguing and running after running after sparklies or whatever the case may be, we're going to miss God's best. We're going to we're not going to be able to do what God really needs us to do or for us to do, so that we can stay free of a lot of this stuff. Because I, I I think that the 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 closer we get to the return of the Lord, the narrower the path becomes that the remnant has to walk. Jolly well said. Um, that's exactly what's going on. I I, I see a lot of believers that I I, I just. I think this is like a lack of discernment. So if you lack discernment of wisdom, ask God will give you more. I mean, there's, there's supernatural things happening. Um, and Christians, I see them running after these, you know, signs or, or with like, you know, there's something miraculous happened over here. Let's go check it out. And it's, it's almost like the Virgin Mary sightings. You know I mean? It's, it's the same kind of feeling. I, I, I went to do some, you know, online, uh, on location research. One thing I learned working with Marzulli is you had to go check it out for yourself, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I felt like I'm out of a group of maybe 12 people I was with, everybody was taken in. And I'm going, well, well, wait a minute. I've got red flags about some of this stuff. This doesn't add up. Where, show me where that is in the scriptures. You know, <laughs> it's, it's that whole, you know, false lying signs and wonders that people are seeing happening today. We're not deep enough in Scripture as we should be. Uh, the Word of God is more accessible in this generation than in probably any other generation before us. You know, just on my notebook computer, 
on the on the several computer programs I have for Bible research. I've got about fifteen thousand volumes, uh, and being able to search that at, at a push of a button. Do you know what some of the reformers could have done <laughs> if they would have had access in a word processor? And I, I look at the the amount of of work that they did and and the books that they published and. I stand at all with what they did with a with a quill and a piece of paper, when here we are with with all this stuff, mm. and I, I think part of it's devotion. Uh, I think part of it is learning to turn tune out the world so that we can be all about fulfilling our divine destiny in God, and letting and letting that really fuel the fire within our hearts. I, you remind me of um, Charles Spurgeon. I, I, David Livingston came, you know. Um, the, the visit him and he said, the Spurgeon, how, how are you, you're working 20 hours a, a day sitting there, you know, working on these sermons. And, and he, he, Spurgeon looked up and said, you forget there's two of us, meaning in the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, right. How much more can we do right now? And I think that's another issue that, you know, a lot of Christians are not reading the word. Um, we should, again, you know, do what the Lord says rather than what other people are telling us. Um, and, and even to balance, you have to balance out your diet, because I see a lot of people, whether they're running after the, uh, whether it's flat earth, hollow earth, or just or even, even conspiracy theory. You can't live on that. I, Mary and I have actually had to pray for people that got so into that, and they're calling saying, my life is falling apart. Uh, I'm paranoid all the time. I'm agitated. I can't sleep. Well, what are you watching? Well, I'm watching this conspiracy and this conspiracy, and then and I spend five hours a day watching YouTube. And I said, no, no, you have to have an 80-20 diet. 80% the word, 80% has to be good, solid preaching from the Word of God. 20% looking at this other stuff. Or you're, you're, gonna, you're killing yourself not getting the spiritual nutrition that you need. So when we're getting half-truth, on, um, how do we know which half's the truth? That's the issue, right? I mean, if you're doing 80-20, and, I mean, it's just like the enemy, isn't it? Like, like it didn't even in, the, in America, they, um, for the Native Americans, they came, and they, I remember some story where they gave them steak dinners, but that strychnine in it. Um, terrible things that were going on. I mean, it's like, you know, the same spirits that have been messing with people since the time began, they're still there behind the scenes, these invisible entities trying to destroy, kill, and do as much damage as they can to the kingdom of darkness. Well, I think one of the things I like to do, I like to go back to some of the greats in the body of Christ over the over the centuries. And for some of them, I've actually had people write me scathing letters because I recommended Charles Spurgeon. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're equating the Calvinism of his day with hyper-grace today. And, it, and because of his relationship with D.L. Moody, uh, I mean, Spurgeon did not fit the mold of an average Calvinist because he taught to lead children to Christ while they were still on your knee. And a, a true hardcore Calvinist would never do that because they would say that's the job of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't even give an altar call. Uh, but yet he's known as the prince of preachers because he could expound scripture so powerfully. Uh, that uh, that it, it it changed people's lives forever. D.L. Moody's another one. Uh, I, I go, I'll go back and I'll open our Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, you sent me a video about him today. There's there are many of his sermons that are out there. Uh, D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey. We we need to go back and and have some good things that we can cut our teeth on to bring a solid foundation before we begin dealing with a lot of this other stuff. Because you can't listen to what I would call po popular preaching today. Uh, we, we got guys now saying you can't trust the word of God because it's not inerrant. And so, you, so I don't, I don't care if you're pastoring a mega church, you could be mega wrong, brother. You know, it's, uh, we, we need to go back and follow those that have a history. They love Jesus. They love the word of God with all their hearts and they wanted to give true doctrine. And we're, we're going to have to go back to, to having libraries and, uh, uh, dust off something called old fashioned books. Uh, not, not everything is going to be on YouTube. Absolutely. Um, I, I recall years ago doing um, a conference with uh, 
Dr. Carolyn Life and um, my husband Mark, good friends, and they both came up to me because they, they'd heard me do, do the worship music before several times, but this first time I actually did lectures with them. They said, uh, you reminded us as, as, as a modern day Charles Spurgeon, which really, you know, blew me away that they said that. And I went back and started reading Spurgeon and going, you know, there are some similarities there. I mean, just get back to the word of God. Let's get back yeah. to the first century Christianity when it was working. So, and Spurgeon, Spurgeon would move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And maybe not, it may, that may not have fit within the framework of his Baptist Calvinistic mindset, but I've, I've seen him given words of knowledge and, and words of wisdom right in the middle of his sermons. There's one particular sermon where there was a guy that was a shoemaker that had missed the last Sunday. And Spurgeon called him out and said, you decided not to go to church and to open up your store uh, last Sunday. And uh, you made like six pence or something like that. It was real, pet, you know, pity. And he said, that day, sir, you sold your, your soul to the devil for six pence instead of getting into the word of God and, and showing your devotion to Christ. And he, he would move in those things. And we, I, I think part of this um, war cycle and aggravation cycle is people go to the extreme about everything. Every, everything is either absolutely black or white. And the, some of the historically, some of the greatest expository preachers have been Calvinists, but they've been what I call modified Calvinists. Uh, and we, we, of course, we have Oratory. We have we have so many others here in in America that have been outstanding. And we 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 want we tend to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, we think we know a little bit, and and people say, you know, I know a little bit about this. And after talking with them, I want to say, yeah, you do very very little about this and it's time for you to dig more because one of the dangerous things in the world is to have somebody that think they really know something when they don't i i we i mean you and i have experienced a lot of the same things people coming up and say well men wrote the bible you know i'm going okay so we got 40 different writers over about 1500 years the divine inspiration and, and the, the lord wrote this, the scriptures for right all scriptures given for inspiration for, of God for profit, for doctrine, uh, for correction, and instructions in righteousness, right? Um, that we may be finished for good works, right? So, and I was thinking about that, um, you know, Matthew sat down, he's writing to primarily, um, um, he, was, he was a first-hand witness when he wrote. Um, he, the Lord said, you know, that he would send a comforter to us, and um, Matthew was probably writing to a mostly primarily Jewish audience at the time. I um, mean, you can see by his vocabulary, his um, style, the grammar, the syntax, um, in his writings. And then Peter, you know, Second Peter, um, one twenty-one, you know, the prophecy came not of old times, but of the will of man, but by holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah told us, you know, there's a fire in his bones, no escaping. He had to write down what God said. Well, I. I look at people and I go, like, so what about the poet John Milton? He went blind when he was about 44 years old. And he, he dictated his entire book, Paradise Lost, The Friends and Relatives. Somebody come for a cup of tea. Hey, while you're sitting there drinking your tea, I, I, I'd like you to, you know, I'll dictate something and you write it for me, please. And he write the entire thing. It was like 10,500 you know, words or something like that. Well, nobody would not, you know, question. Anybody could question that, did he write? Paradise Lost was fully his work. So why is it, you know, so hard for people to understand this God used 40 different writers? Oh, and, and there's there's a supernatural uniformity uh, within the Word of God, and there is there is an absolute uh, divine consistency or, or flow from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, it's as if it was one voice, yet many writers. And the only the only book on the planet that can say that is the Bible. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no contradiction. People keep trying to find them, but there really isn't. They could all be explained away. Um, and we got that whole thing with um, you know, in Ephesians 2, um, where we're, we're raised up together, made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that's talking about a spiritual resurrection from death, from, from our sins, from the iniquities, generational iniquities. And it's just as definite and complete as physical resurrection. I mean, that's going to happen for the Christian. We're going to live forever. You know, with quantum physics now, um, you can be in two places at one time, right? I mean, if an electron can do it um, and protons can do it, then in theory, even morons can do it. 
Well, I'll tell you what, brother, when you get that one figured out, show me how. <laughs> well, you know, there was scientists back in, um, they won a um, Nobel Prize in physics in 2012 for that. Um, um, one placed a, a single a, a proton in a box and hit it with an atom, and the other one did it the other way. Um, proving this, uh, Albert Einstein said, you know, this was too spooky, so he didn't want to mess with it. But um, I, I think this is opening up a whole lot of, you know, we, we look at the word of God, it says, it, it's written, eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor are there ends in the heart of man, the things that God's prepared for them that love him. Yeah. And, and then he talks about us going for the deeper things, and that's why we're here on Spiritual Encounters, going for the deeper things. And about, you know, in, in a great sense, I think we can be two places at one time. When we got born again, our spirit man was reconnected to the third heaven. The Word of God says that when we pray, the hope that is within us appears beyond the veil. Uh, in fact, I recently taught on uh, the Scroll of Destiny out of Revelation 5. And in it, I just simply made the comment, you know, when the, the elders begin this, because Revelation 5 is the largest worship session ever recorded in the Word of God. And in it, the, the elders had these censers, which are all the prayers of the saints. There, there is no such thing as a lost prayer. That all the prayers that we pray manifest in heaven and they're contained in censers that can be placed before the throne of God. And even at that moment in, in Revelation chapter 5, when Jesus is found worthy to open the scroll, every prayer of every believer was laid before him as an act of worship. Now, let an electron do that. Well, you think about that, the Lord took some of the most unlikely people and did amazing, extraordinary things through them. He took some smelly old, uneducated fishermen, empowered them, he commissioned them, go, you know, heal the sick, in my name, raise the dead, cleanse the leopard. Um, so, I, you know, I used a donkey to speak in number 22. I figured he could even use an old rock and roller like me. Um, he sent that, out the my go to verse. <laughs> <laughs> He sent out the 70, he sent the rest of us in every preceding generation. Um, so that's what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, the church needs to get activated. What do we have to do to get people engaged? Most Christians, to my amazement, have, have never led one person to, to, into salvation. I mean, God does the saving, but your job is to, to share the good news. How is that? How, how is it that they haven't prayed for the sick? They haven't cast all demons in the almighty name of Jesus when he's commissioned us clearly to go make disciples to do these things. I think we have been too Greco-Roman in our mindset about the church. We've turned it into entertainment. It, it's theater. It's entertainment. Guys, Christianity is a full contact sport. And every one of us have a place on the field. And just, just showing somebody the love of Christ, showing them patience, compassion, uh, may open the door to a greater conversation. We, we all don't have to be great orders, but we, we do have to be able to move in compassion, show love, show understanding, and be ready in season and out of season to give a reason for the hope that is within us. That's the call of every believer. And I, I think we all need to return to that and to realize God has not placed us on the earth to be entertained. Paul said that we were recreated into, into, in Christ Jesus unto good works. And uh, quote, to quote you know, Coach Dave, it's time for us to get on the field. We need to say, Holy Spirit, Coach, put us in. I'm ready to play. Yeah, not bench uh, warming. You're right, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is that we, we think about that we... we Talk to people, most people we talk to that don't know the, this, you ask them, you know, like the, the, the ones that go out, they want to use, um, you know, behold, I stand at the door, knock, if any man open. And so, well, that's written to the believer, not the unbeliever to, to begin with, but that's fine. You're trying to lead someone into salvation. Most people tell you, you know, but I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven. And yet the Bible tells us clearly all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Um, we look at Jesus saying that the greatest commandment, love God with all your mind, body, spirit, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself. So with the modern tower of Babel today, I mean the internet, um, 
right? I mean, who's done that? Who, who of us have kept that commandments? Um, we've broken the Ten Commandments. Most people don't even know what they are anymore. Um, so there's, there's a lot to it, you know. I think about um, Nicodemus comes sneaking in at night, right? He doesn't want his friends to know. I mean, he's a well-respected man about town, let's face it, right? Nicodemus was a powerful man in his day. And he comes to Jesus, he goes, Rabbi, we know you, you're a great teacher, come from God, because nobody can do these miracles unless God sent them. And, and Jesus just cuts the, the, the chase. He says straight away, gets to the heart of Mesa, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And Nicodemus is like stressing out, like, well, how can I get born again? This is a well-educated man of his day, asking, how can you be born twice? And then the, the Lord gives him some, you know, deeper insights. He said, well, look, you know, the wind's going, and you, you don't know where it's going, where it comes from, but you can see it moving. And, and if they tell you, you know, um, more uh, heavenly things, and you can't even understand these earthly things, how am I going to share these more deeper truths with you? I think he gave him um, what was back in, um, in, in his day, um, in numbers, um, you know, talks about uh, any Pharisee would know there, you know, that Moses lifted up the serpent uh, in the wilderness and he's trying to get him to understand that God sent him the Son of Man not to condemn the world, but through him that he might be saved. You know, there's there's actually a Jewish ritual that they would do in the synagogue. I, I forgot all the particulars about it, but the, the man would mikvah at the end of it. And after he mikvah, the entire congregation would say, born again. Mm. And so it's like you know, have you have you, have you not learned from the examples, Nicodemus? What what what's not connecting here? Right. And the Lord say, hey, well, it's not exactly the way you've been taught all your life. This this is the word of God. I am the word of God. The living word of God. Yeah. Do it my way, right? So um, maybe there's somebody watching right now. You don't understand, you know that. Would you be so kind to just to pray with them? What would we tell somebody that doesn't know? Maybe someone needs to, you may just need to rededicate your life today. You, you know the truth. And um, now's the time to make your peace with God. Don't wait another moment. Today's the day of salvation. Yeah. I, I think right now the Holy Spirit is, is dealing with all of us. He's getting ready to do something. And I, I don't know if it's going to be on the day of Pentecost or in the season where, that we're in. But God wants us to be ready. And I think for every one of us, number one, if you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you need to know that he loves you. He knew you before the foundation of the world. And that fact, Casper, to me is, is mind-blowing, that he knew us before the world was, and yet he went ahead and made the world. Mm -hmm. And he allowed us to be born. He allowed the, the whole thing for us to come into existence. But then it goes even further. He said that, he loved us so much that he gave himself for us on the cross as a ransom. That's how much God loves us. He loves us right where we are, but he also loves us enough to never leave us there. Because every one of us have, have uh, had bad problems. Every one of us have had confusion, hurts, wounds in life, and everything else. And the same price that Jesus paid on the cross to save us is the same price that he paid to heal and restore us. And it's a package deal. It all comes with salvation. It's just learning more about him, who he is and what he wants to do for us. And I think we're in a season of examination and yielding. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mary and I shared on our podcast today, uh, looking at Elijah at Mount Carmel with the, with the uh, sacrifice he did and the challenge with the prophets of Baal, he, re he repaired the altar of God, and then he set things in proper order. And I, I think that's our calling in this day and this season is look in our lives where the altar of God is in disrepair. Repair it and set things back in order so that we can have the fire fall. And you, can, you, may look at, you may say, you know, Mike, I don't want the fire to fall because I'm in bondage. Well, there were three guys named Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego that stood for God that were all bound up. And the fire didn't touch them, but it burned off their bonds. There's a supernatural God of God coming in this day and this hour. 
that re- the remnant, wherever they are, that have a heart to serve God, but they're in such bondage they can't do it. There's a fire coming to burn off the bondage for the sake of his great name. Casper, not your name, not my name, not the name of anybody listening, but for his great name, because he has a purpose for all of us. And he's brought us into the kingdom for such a time as this, and we need to yield to it. Now, Father, I just, I just lift up every person that listens to this broadcast. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit would show them in their lives where, they're, where the altar of the Lord has been in disrepair. Father, give them the grace by your Spirit to repair it and to set things in divine order. Father, so that your fire can fall and your purpose can be released, that the situations can be turned around, that sickness and disease can be eliminated out of their lives, their broken hearts can be mended, their broken bodies can be mended. And Father, that your light and your love can be released through your people into this dark and dying world. And Father, we ask it right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen and hallelujah. If you prayed along, let us know. You can uh, contact us at theupperroomfellowship.org and you can get a hold of Dr. Michael Lake at which address do you want them to go to? Uh, Kingdomintelligencebriefing.com And uh, we'll see you all next time for another spiritual encounter. Until then, here, there, in the air, God bless. We should all have the same love for each other There should be no division in our story That we always love one another Let the world see we are Christians and we won't back down. Let the world see we are Christians with a message so profound that signs and wonders follow us around. Let us praise the name of Jesus and do his word. By one spirit we're baptized into one body. Let us stand together and not be deterred. That the Holy Spirit surrounds us in his glory. Let the world see we are Christians And we won't back down Let the world see we are Christians With a message so profound That signs and wonders follow us
Welcome to another adventure with Spiritual Encounters. We are here to help represent God's work, not ours. Besides the insightful biblical teachings shared by our host, Pastor Casper, we are also very blessed to be able to bring you outstanding interviews with some of the most sought after deep thinkers and voices in Christendom today, helping to make a difference in this world for Christ's sake. We want to keep it that way, to be truly effective in internal matters, truly demands on prayer and being led of the Holy Spirit. If you, like us, long to see the Lord Jesus, Yoshua, glorified here through spiritual encounters, we invite you to join the prayer team. There is nothing more exciting than participating in intercessory prayer with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are a totally faith-based ministry and so please give and support spiritual encounters as you are led. Truly Grace and Radio have a lot in common. Grace is free to us, but cost Christ an untold price, we may never fully understand this side of heaven. Radio is also free, too. It costs nothing to turn on your dial or stream audio, but it costs us a lot to stay on the air. Spiritual Encounters is almost entirely listener-supported, a privilege, but rare things in these days of big church radio corporations. We've carefully trimmed our budgets to all but wartime essentials, but operating costs are a fact of life. If you've been blessed through our program, here are some ways you can give back as the Holy Spirit leads. Consider becoming an underwriter by contacting us or simply go to the upper room, fellowship.org and scroll down on the main page to donate. Production of the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries. Visit us at theupperroomfellowship.org. This program is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The intro and outro music is performed by Casper McLeod from his album Communion, available at theupperroomfellowship.org. In my face, since I learned to pray. I've got a new life.